come up with a more perfect song for a message. Today I'm going to talk about divine romance. I'm going to talk about just how much does God really love us. Any of us who have been a child or a <coughs> parent can identify with the story of Luke in chapter 15. Why don't you turn there, Luke chapter 15. It's interesting. We preached in Luke chapter, we studied Luke chapter 15 last week. We talked about excellence. But you know what? There's about 14 different stories in this chapter. Luke 15. Luke 15. We'll look at the rest of the story today. You know, every single one of you have been a prodigal. Without a doubt, you and I, from one time to another, have gone off and been selfish. Every one of you. And I would, wouldn't be remiss to say that probably some of you right now are being selfish. Doing what you want. Giving God two, as they say. Turn down to uh, verse 11. We'll look at this a little bit. We're going to answer the question, how much does God love me? Verse 11, then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered everything together and journeyed to a far off country, where he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent it all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into the fields to feed, to feed swine. And he would gladly filled his, would have filled his stomachs with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have enough bread to, and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will raise up, excuse me, I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring the best robe and put, on, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they began to be merry. Stop right there. Pray with me, would you? Lord, Many of us are hurting this day. We have pushed you away. We have failed to see the blessings. The enemy has caused much grief in our life to the place where we're bitter and we doubt. Lord, some are even on the fringe saying, why should I even bother? Today, Lord, convict our hearts. Speak to us. May we feel that warm embrace once again. May we see your presence. May we see you looking over the edge of our of our tragedies. And look at us. Be with us now as we study this in your son's name. We'll come back to that in a minute. So how much does God love you? I love verse 20. Let's go back and look at verse 20, would you? And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
first thing I want you to see about how much God loves you today is God never gives up on you to a You hear me? God never gives up on you. Ever. You see, the first thing that we can count on is that God is never going to stop waiting for us. God is there. It's clearly demonstrated in the telling of the stories of the lost coin and the sheep. The tenacity, the passion, and then the tone of voice that is used as Jesus just focuses on this. Now go back to the beginning of Luke 13 with me, would you? And let's look at the story of the lost coin and sheep. In Luke 15, then the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to him, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and then he comes home and he calls together his friends and his neighbors and says, Rejoice for me, for, with me, because I have found my sheep which was lost. And I said to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven for over one sinner who repents than over 99 persons who just had no need for repentance. I used to think differently about that passage. And God spoke to me about something here. Who's a sinner? Everybody. Just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you're no longer a sinner. You see, you can easily, if you are a fundamentalist, skip over this and say, this is only God caring about those who don't know Jesus. And it's true. However, look at the context of what he's talking about here. Because context matters when you're reading scripture. God is talking about the fact that one sinner rejoicing in heaven who has been found. How many times have you fallen down? How many times have you gotten back into brokenness? How many times have you been involved in stuff as a believer in Christ that you had no business being involved with? And yet, God has called you to repentance. God has said, you need to make things right with me. You need to reaffirm the relationship and move on. Well, listen, go back to this and look at this. He says, rejoice for me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. When God talks about sheep in the Bible, he's not talking about the lost people. When he talks about the goats, he's talking about lost people. He's talking about one of us. I say to you likewise that there will be more joy in heaven with one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. God cares about the broken people. God cares about those who get who linger a little bit behind. So I want you to think for a second. We talked about we're talking about the losses, but we're talking about who does Jesus address here? Many people just focus on the tax collectors. Or maybe the Pharisees that hate him. Man, it's so easy to focus. We talk way too much about the stuff that we don't like in Christianity than talking about how good God is. I hate that about Christianity. We will sit and gripe and moan and complain about every Democrat under the sun. They're sinners. Conservatives? Oh, they're not sinners. <laughs> you would think that that's what people believe. Unless you're Democrat. Then everybody's wrong. Even other Democrats. I was raised in a democratic council. Anyway, Pharisees. Churches are full of them. Hey, you know, I love worship in, my, in this church, but I hate the word but. You know what I want to do when I hear the word but? I want to find a roll of toilet paper and shove it in that person's face, right in their mouth. I do. I want to gib slap them. Because that little word but destroys people's lives. That's what the Pharisees done. Everywhere in the Pharisees, you know, Jesus had this religious crowd that followed him around, pointing out what they didn't particularly care about his ministry. By the way, as a pastor, 
or as a leader in the church, an elder, or a deacon, let me tell you something. If that's what Jesus had to put up with, stop your whining if that's what you're putting up with. Because Jesus had to put up with it. In the midst of all this, we lose sight of on the fact that how did God do ministry? This is how God did ministry. He took a group of guys with him, and they went out and they served people. And they got involved in whatever the actions that were going on. Somebody got caught. Let me tell you something. If you're out doing ministry and you're walking down the little street in Falkroft or media and you see some naked woman get thrown out in the street by her husband and somebody, other naked man running down the street because the guy's taking a baseball bat after him and the people are gathering around that little lady with rocks from the cobblestones to pelt her to death because she's been an adulteress? Don't you think you'd stop and get involved in a positive way if you're Jesus? That's how Jesus did ministry. He went out and whatever was going on at that moment in time, he chose to participate in. But he always brought his little entourage of disciples with him. It's a cool thing. That's how he did ministry. He met people where they were. And he always did it with somebody else. He always brought somebody with him. And you see, he's addressing all of these people. He's addressing the sinners, the tax collectors, the politicians. He's addressing the Pharisees who hate him. And he's talking to his disciples all at the same time. Showing people just how much he loves and cares for them. When you really think about it, what patience, what insight, what passion God had for hum humanity. There's a verse in Revelation chapter 20, Rabbi, chapter 3, verse 20. Where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. You see, that wasn't just addressed to lost people. Jesus is the most patient. He's God is patient. He's loving. He's kind. He is sitting at your doorstep waiting for you to make a positive decision. He's waiting for you to repent. What's repentance? Repentance is very simple. You change your direction and mind. You were going this way, which was wrong. You realize your sinfulness. You say, I am now going to go this way and follow God. That's repentance. And God is waiting for every single one of us to, to turn to him. There's a second thing. He's going to run to you when you make a, a good choice. Yeah. God himself is going to run to you in the midst of your troubles when you turn to him. Think back when you were a kid. Or when you were there's a crash, a deathly silence, and then a whine. Is that typically what we have with our kids? I love newborn moms. I really do. They get all the cool gadgets. And then all of a sudden, nothing will scare the life out of a newborn mom listening to that little gadget, and there's deathly silence. They immediately drop whatever they're doing to go see what's going on. True? It's just, it's, just, it's just the nature of being a parent. The moment that you hear silence, you anticipate what's coming and you run to the little one. You fall upon them. You embrace them in love. You smother them with hugs. And you kiss them. Then the fear subsides with the little one. And they reach for you and you go kiss the boo-boo. Nothing reassures a child more than this. In that moment, they forget the pain, they forget the fear, and they draw strength from your comfort and your presence as a parent. And it's the same way with God. In the midst of the silence, God is already running to us. Because he knows in our heart the choices that we have made and the pain that we're going through. He meets you there and embraces you. This was happy with the picture of the prodigal son and his father. While he was yet afar off, his dad ran to him. And that's exactly the picture of what God is going to be doing in your life. Every single time you make a positive choice, you repent. You say, I'm no longer going to live this way. I'm going to live that way. And God's going to meet you there before you ever get to open your mouth. Every time you make a choice to repent of a a thought, a lifestyle, or sin, God runs to you and does the same. 
This simple fact should be the drawing card of Christianity. It is the desire of every human being to be loved and affirmed. Yet, we talk about junk all the time as Christians. We talk about what we don't like and who we don't like and what we don't like and what we, don't, what we think we don't like. We don't talk about what matters. We don't talk about how much forgiveness is made in our lives. We glorify the sin that, oh, I was once this. We need to be talking about what we are now in Christ. The forgiveness. And the people who are without will want what we have. Because what they're really asking, they're not asking why you were once an axe murderer. They're asking you, what have you found? Because they're all looking for it. Every single human being has a hole in his heart, a void, an emptiness. And they have this desire, this thirst for something to fill it. And they're trying everything under the sun, whether it's success or wealth or lands and houses or vacations or drugs or alcohol or another relationship. They're all looking for something to fill that void. And yet the only thing that's going to fill that void is a relationship with Christ. And yet, we struggle with this, this issue that we don't believe God. Because you see, there's a third thing. God is going to spend, he's going to linger there, he's going to be there, he's going to be waiting for you, he's going to run to you when you make a decision, and then he's going to remind you of who you are, who your identity is in him. Go back to Luke 15, look at the prodigal. What happened? The father says, you're my son. You were once dead. You are now alive. Let me put a cloak on you. Let me put a ring on your finger. Let's kill the calf. Let's have a party to remind you to celebrate who you are in this family. And that's exactly what God does in each and every one of your lives. He will go out of his way to remind you of who you are in him. But there's a problem. You see, in Christianity... We're adopted. Every single human being is adopted into God's family. Lest you forget, there's an abandonment issue that comes about. Uh, you know, being a parent of adopted children, I've had to study this thing called reactive attachment disorder. You see what happens when children who don't have a true family, and the older they are, the more severe it is. They push people away because they never had the security of a parent. You see, the problem is with every single one of us in Christianity, we have that same problem. No matter what age that you came to Christ, you have react reactive attachment disorder in your faith life. You can never believe God wholly and completely for who you are. You struggle with your identity in Him. You struggle with what He says who you are. And every time God attempts to love you and to smother you and to give you that kiss on your boo-boo, you push him away a little bit. You say, I know I'm not good enough. Put that pious thing on. I remember my little boy Shane. Most of you didn't know him. We had him for a short time. Shane was a four-year-old. One night Shane came in. I was sitting on the bed, lounging, reading. A cool guy comes in. And he sits on the foot of the bed. He has a little tuck head. He a little itty-bitty guy. A little buzz cut. Even that little itty-bitty guy had an Irish accent. Him and Dennis and his brother, they, they, had, they had Irish accents because they were from Ireland, you know? And little Shane was sitting on the foot of my bed, and he starts to sniffle a little bit. I said, what's, what's, what's going on, buddy? He goes, did I ever tell you why I'm here? Now, I knew the story. I knew his dad was a thug. I knew he was placed with us in secret uh, because the father had known that he showing up in people's houses with a sawed-off shotgun, kicking doors in to take his kids back. So I knew that we were in danger. 
constantly. He said, I saw my daddy beat my mommy up. Mind you, he's four years old. And my daddy locked my mommy in the closet. And I heard her crying. And when my daddy left the room, I went over and unlocked the door to let my mommy out. And my dad came back in the room and grabbed me by the neck and threw me across the room against the wall. That little guy struggled with love. Little little guy, he'd want the hug, but he would push you away after a while. Because he didn't feel worthy of it. Every single one of us are little shades. Every single one of us have gone through oh. stuff in our life. That God has intervened. God has shown his love. God has redeemed us. God has set us free. And yet, in the midst of God loving on us and making us known of who we are in him, that we are now his child, we push him away a little bit. We won't accept our identity. And you see, that's a struggle that every Christian is going to go through. And you know, you know what the uh, solution for a lot of it is? I'm going to ask you a question, just to show hands. And this is not a right or wrong answer. I'm just taking the temperature in the room. How many of you, when you came to Christ, when you came to Christ and accepted Christ, did you have a disciple maker in your life? A person who met with you on a regular basis, who showed you the ropes, who taught you about who God was, who you hung out with. Mine was Ennis Pepper, who's a missionary to South Africa. When I was in the front house, he showed up every afternoon about 3 o'clock, we had a cup of job when we hung out, shoot some, we would shoot some hoops, and we'd sit down under a tree and get our Bibles out and talk about Jesus. I had, I had someone who discipled me personally. How many of you guys had that in your life? Now, I want to show you something that's important about this. When I was at a pastor's conference a couple of weeks ago, a guy was speaking, he asked the same question. And there were 45 or so pastors in the room. Seven of us raised our hands. You see, making disciples is the most important. Jesus said in, in Matthew, go and make disciples. He didn't say go evangelize. He didn't go say necessarily to feed the poor. He said go make disciples. There's a physical involvement here. You see, if you don't have a spiritual parent in your life when you come to Christ, you could very well suffer from spiritual abandonment. You very well could have reactive attachment disorder in church, where because you never had someone make, you, make a disciple in your life and talk to you the ropes and was there for you and had that wingman and that buddy system, you're going to walk around and reject God and let everything God says about you on a regular basis. Yes, you are. Because you're going to have that, that fear. I don't really know who God is. I know who God is, but I don't know who I am. And we have churches full of people who are struggling with a spiritual identity. And you've been adopted. I want you to turn to, to Isaiah 43. I'm not going to really preach on this. I just want to read this to you. It's a long passage, but I want you to hear what God says about his, his nation, his people. Because when you start hearing what God says about who you are, it'll change your life. You see, being a disciple is the most critically important thing for a new Christian. Isaiah chapter 43. I'm going to read the whole thing. Let it resonate in your heart as I read it. Isaiah chapter 43. We're going to start in verse 1. But now... Thus saith the Lord, Who created you, O Jacob? And he formed you, O Israel. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be there with you. And through the rivers, and they shall not, not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for your place. And since you were, since you were precious in my sight, 
You have been honored, and I have loved you, and therefore I give men to you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring to your descendants from the east, and I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who calls, who is called by my name, who I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled who among them can declare this. Show us the former things. Let us bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it's the truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant who I have chosen. You have made known and believe me. And understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be me shall be after me. I even I am the Lord. Besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, I have proclaimed, and there is no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am He. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and I will reverse it. Thus saith the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives. The Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus the Lord, thus says the Lord, who makes the way in the sea, and the path through the mighty waters, who brings forth forth the chariots and horse and the army and the power. They shall lie down together and they shall not rise. They shall they are extinguished. They are quenched like the wicked. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now I will spring forth. Shall I shall you not know it? I will make a road in the wilderness and the rivers and the desert. The beasts in the field will honor me and the jackals and the ostriches because I give the waters in the wilderness, the dead rivers in the desert, to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, and they shall be declared my praise. Wow. In the midst of all that, you know what Israel did? Pushed God away. Walked away. They said, talk to him. I'd rather build this little copper idol over here or this statue over here I want to bow down and pray to. You see something that we see in that whole passage? God ran to Israel. God embraced Israel. God said, you're my children, I have adopted you, I am your God, I am there for you, I love you, you matter to me, I will do all these things on your behalf. He, he recited all his benefits of being their God, and yet they had this reactive attachment disorder that they pushed God away, said, no, 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 that's not my identity, let me seek other gods, let me find other things. You see, when you choose to follow God, God is already there waiting. And then he runs to you in the midst of the silence. He puts his hand over your mouth and says, you don't even have to confess. I'm here to kiss you and love you. I'm here to put a robe on you. Put a ring on your finger. Let's kill the best animal that we've got. Put on the best party that we got to celebrate the fact that you are my child. So how much does God love you? There's a uh, little thing that I used to do, I still do. Back when my wife and I would make little cards, you know, it's Valentine's Day this week. My wife and I used to make our little handmade cards and give each other handmade cards. We'd take photographs of something that was special, we'd glue it to the thing, and we would write a poem. My wife was much more poetic than I was. One day, when I was in college, she put in my mailbox this card. And inside the card, 
was a little stick figure. Now for her, that was a shock, first of all. A stick figure. I mean, I married an artist, you know, who paints like Rockwell, you know? A little stick figure. And there was little dotted lines coming out from arms. And, it, and then there was these little pieces of paper that were glued on the two corners of the page, the little paper doll hands that fell out like this. And she said, I love you this much. That's how much I love you. There's a verse that I've had on my heart all week. It's, it's Ephesians 3.20. It says this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, and according to the power that works in us. There's a power of God that he wants to work in your life. And it requires repentance. It requires you to say, I am not going into this way anymore. Whether it's the first time or it's every time. The first time you do, you, the first time you repent, they say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm screwed up. I want to live for you. You say it, you mean it, and you say, God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. And God says, now you're my child. From that day forward, you will always be his child. You can't lose that identity. Yes, you can fall down. You can skin your knee. You can sin. You can go back to perdition. You can go back to what that lifestyle is, and then you've got to work your way back out of it. But the fact is, your position doesn't change in Christ and who you are as Lord and Savior. Once you, you can't lose your salvation. But you can walk away and be far away. If you're struggling in sin this morning as a Christian, God's sitting at the table this morning waiting for you to make a choice. If you've never experienced who Christ is as Savior, my challenge is this, now that you know how much God loves you, what are you waiting for? Is there any reason to put off turning to him? Is there any reason? See, I didn't preach about sin today. I talked about not the problems. I talked about how much he loves you. He's waiting for you. He wants to run to you. He wants to embrace you. He wants to kiss you. He wants to remind you just how much you matter in the kingdom. struggle with our identity where do we really believe you fully for who you say we are in you know, we might be struggling with a sin area of our life that's keeping us from you that's causing us to doubt you Lord today would be the day that we hearken unto your voice today would be the day that we make a decision for you today would be the day that we say enough of this I'm one with God bless that for yourselves <coughs>